Good day everyone, this is uh, Chris with the Ancient Scholar. So today I'm going to begin talking about um, hypoxic injury and hypoxic damage. We'll do an um, overview of that. We won't go into an incredible amount of detail, but I do want to touch on the high points. And certainly this is something nice to appreciate simply because of uh, what we do as respiratory therapists. Oxygen, of course, plays a pretty big role in what, what, what goes on, what happens. So we talk about hypoxic injury. Hypoxic injury hypoxia is is um, you know defined as a basically you can define it as a, as a lack of oxygen to the cells the cells are not getting enough oxygen it's pretty common and and, and often it, it is deadly to cells and there are certain cells such as brain cells uh, cells of the kidneys cells of the heart that are not very tolerant of hypoxic environments now there are certain other types of cells that are actually relatively tolerant several minutes to even hours in some case. Um, when we talk about uh, maybe uh, muscle tissue, uh, skeletal muscles, uh, certain skeletal muscles can be uh, what we call ischemic or lacking or low on oxygen for relatively long periods of time and, and end up doing okay, whereas other types of cells, uh, certainly you know things like neurons and, and um, um, myocardial cells, are they're not as tolerant. Uh, they don't have um, the the reserves. Um, you've probably heard of the the uh, certain types of myoglobin, which kind of act as energy reserves. Um, certain types of myoglobin don't have that, um, and certain types do, and that plays a big role in in how tolerant cells are of um, prolonged hypoxia. Um, how does hypoxia happen? Lots of ways. Well, probably the the easiest thing to imagine is if I place somebody in a hypoxic environment, um, they uh, hit their head at the bottom of the pool, pass out, um, are knocked unconscious, they're underwater, they're not breathing, they drown, uh, they're in a burning fire, and um, are in an oxygen poor environment. Um, there's probably some some pretty obvious uh, examples, but there are really some subtle there there are really some subtle things that occur as well. And I want to go ahead and just mention these subtle things that lead to hypoxia: um, loss of hemoglobin function. Um, let's say that the hemoglobin uh, doesn't function normally. Uh, it's it's incredibly right or incredibly left shifted for a num number of various reasons. Um, let's say that I have carbon monoxide poisoning, and carbon monoxide, of course, has a little over 200 times. Uh, hemoglobin has a little over 200 times the affinity for carbon monoxide than it does oxygen. Um, so carbon monoxide is going to bind to hemoglobin uh, quite readily, and uh, that's going to create a hypoxic um, environment. Uh, to, to the tissue because carbon monoxide is certainly not oxygen. Uh, diseases of the respiratory system, diseases of the cardiovascular system, um, loss of cytochrome activity. You guys remember the cytochrome, uh, cytochrome oxidase, or um, uh, the not cytochrome oxidase, but the cytochromes um, are the proteins um, that are involved in oxidative phosphorylation and certain toxins uh, like cyanide for example can deactivate some of these uh, cytochromes I believe um, cyanide deactivates cytochrome C oxidase and of course that's where um, oxygen kinda does its magic um, in accepting uh, electrons and protons uh, so you can deactivate the cell's ability to use oxygen as well and that's going to basically create a hypoxic environment for the cell because it can't use that oxygen people that um, lose a lot of blood for example they lose hemoglobin they lose red blood cells clearly they're going to be hypoxic people that go to high altitudes perhaps um, spend extended periods of time at high altitudes can, can also be hypoxic so there are lots of different causes of hypoxia and uh, you know, obviously, we need to be pro investigator hats on and, and try to identify those causes if if, if um, they're very subtle. Um, some of the classic signs and symptoms of, of hypoxia in, in, in um, adult patients will be um, cardiac and mental status changes. The mental status will change. They may be anxious. Um, they may not be acting right. Their level of consciousness may change. Um, you're also going to generally see some cardiovascular changes, tachycardia, 
um, and premature ventricular contractions are, are very common manifestations of hypoxia. And typically, we'll say when we see somebody that develops uh, significant uh, tachycardias and, and uh, ventricular ectopy, or what we call PVCs, premature ventricular contractions. Something you'll talk about a little later on in the program. We talk about um, ECG monitoring. Um, these are these are pretty cardinal findings for hypoxia, and we want to treat treat those findings as hypoxia until we rule that out and, and um, rule in other causes. Um, in pediatric patients, actually, uh, because he, pediatric patients don't have a, a very well developed or matured nervous system, they will often develop bradycardia in response to hypoxia. So babies, for example, newborn babies that, that are bradycardic, they have a low heart rate, um, the very first thing we need to consider is the presence of, uh, underlying presence of hypoxia. Um, now, we also need to uh, look at um, bradycardia in adults that um, become bradycardic. Um, we need to consider hypoxia as well. Generally, adults will become tachycardic first, but if with sustained, uh, sustained hypoxia, they can develop uh, significant bradycardias. Um, so, bradycardia in an adult as well may be um, an indication of hypoxia. Okay, so um, cells that become hypoxic, uh, obviously they don't, uh, their, their metabolic processes are altered, and we talked a little bit about that in earlier videos, um, what happens to oxidative phosphorylation, and um, when the cells become hypoxic, obviously they're not creating energy, and they're not able to maintain homeostasis, and uh, you know, they, they can secrete um, lots of different uh, substances, signaling um, molecules. And some of these signaling molecules can be damaging to other cells um, in other parts of the body. Um, they can cause inflammation. Uh, they can cause swelling. They can cause changes in some of these other cells, even cells in other parts of the body that aren't necessarily hypoxic. They can cause... Um, uh, damaging or deleterious changes in, in these patients. Um, <clears throat> uh, another thing that we need to wor be worried about with uh, hypoxia is what's called the development of a free radical or um, a radical species. And this is actually something that we hear a lot, people talk about these a lot, but we don't necessarily have a great appreciation of what free radicals are. And I'm going to just talk about free radicals in a general sense. Um, what, what a free radical is, is, is um, if you can imagine a, an atom, a happy atom, what is one of the defining characteristics of a happy atom, or a happy molecule even, what we can say molecules, um, the atoms within the molecules? Well, there's this concept known as the octet rule. And, and basically what that says is um, the atoms... Um, in their outer shell of electrons, and uh, their outer energy shell, the atoms like to have eight electrons. And uh, we say that these eight electrons produce a stable atom. Now, this is just a rule of thumb. It, it is not the case for all atoms. Um, it's pretty much the case for atoms that have um, their outer shells in what we call the p-block orbitals, um, which are... Uh, consist of a fair majority of um, the um, alkaline earth metals and the non-metals and in most of the uh, m most of the atoms of, of what we call organic chemistry uh, carbon carbon chemistry and and all the things that go along with that uh, hydrogen um, magnesium nitrogen and all that most of those atoms do obey this rule um, the transition metals do not, however. Um, their their, their um, valence electrons are in d orbitals, and there's something called crystal field theory that, that we actually have to use to explain them. Um, we're not going to get into that in this video. But let's just say, for the most part, uh, atoms are generally happy when they can get eight electrons in their valence shell, their outer shell. Um, so here's just an example of an atom. Uh, it can be any kind of atom, and it's happy. It has eight electrons, and, and, and maybe it, it's bonded to other atoms and sharing electrons. Um, it doesn't have to be by itself, but either way, it has eight electrons, and it's happy. Now, what happens with a, a radical species or a free radical is I can lose one of those electrons. 
So I'll go ahead and draw a picture of a generic radical species in the green here, and you can notice down here that there's a one, what we call an unpaired electron. Um, this makes the atom very happy. The atom wants an electron very badly, and that atom is going to go through great lengths to obtain an electron. And what that means is this free radical can attack cells and, in essence, steal electrons from cell membranes and, and cell proteins and so on and so forth, um, you know, DNA, uh, what have you. Well, electrons, of course, are responsible for the chemical bonds, and if I have these free radicals about stealing electrons, breaking bonds, that's generally not good for things like DNA, for cell walls, and this can be very damaging to cells, and that is um, the basic theory behind why free radicals are so bad, and um, why um, in hypoxic uh, cells, um, the development of free radicals, because things, uh, met metab metabolic processes aren't working, you know, can be such a concern. Uh, generally, free radical development happens pretty quick. Um, there are some newer uh, modalities that we're looking at it, uh, decreasing um, free radical production. And you may hear the term therapeutic hypothermia. It's actually something we'll be talking about in ACLS now. Um, in the uh, the coming years uh, when you guys take ACLS and we find that if we actually cool people down a little bit especially people that have had a cardiac arrest and we've been able to resuscitate them and get a heartbeat back what we can do is we can cool them down for a day or two and we can decrease the production of these free radicals so sometimes um, hypoxia is a weird thing in that uh, sometimes when our patients get hypoxic um, it's not the hypoxia that kills them right out. It's when we get we reestablish um, perfusion and we we get oxygen flooding back into the cells. Well, the cells have been without oxygen for so long; they're uh, in essence a little shocked and um, not able to really get back into the normal swing of things because they they've been without oxygen for so long that um, um, you give them flood them with all this oxygen. And, and, of course, what do we have? We have a lot of oxygen in there, and, of course, oxygen um, is one of the um, atoms that, that is common in free radicals. Um, um, so sometimes it's not the initial hypoxic event. It's um, after the hypoxia has gone away and we've reestablished circulation, and it's actually this reestablishing of perfusion um, that can cause all the free radical development. But we find in certain patients, uh, medical patients typically, trauma patients, not so much, but medical patients um, have had maybe a heart attack and a cardiac arrest or something, uh, do respond to much better. People survive um, to get out of the hospital with, with their brain functions intact uh, much better if we can institute a, um, where we keep them cool uh, for a day or two and then warm them back up. We can negate some of that. Um, hypoxic, the free radical damage, or that's, uh, that's what we think. So therapeutic hypothermia is coming to a hospital near you. Okay, guys, um, as always, take care.